Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Here's the story. Facebook ripping apart the fabric of society, according to a former top boss. And I just don't know. The question is not one of the stuff that they publish on there. Obviously, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the lack of controls. And, do you know, I think that the, they were fit in the American election, the most shared, the 50, 50 most shared untrue stories before a true story got into the charts. Got that statistic right, I think, but I double check. So the, there was more traffic on Facebook for the, for fifty fifty stories that weren't true beat the highest polling story that was actually true, and and that is not what the boss is talking about. There's a sort of evolution underway with social media because that word social is incredibly misleading. Social media is not media in the traditional sense of the word because media is, is regulated and usually edited, whereas, of course, social media is utterly, utterly consumer-driven. So you can write whatever you want and it can be halfway around the world before the truth has got its boots on. It's, it's a fascinating social development in the history of humans and it's, it's underway. Uh, we've got this tendency, haven't we, of thinking you've got to have an opinion on everything. But actually, while things are still changing, it's hard to... Or, or it's not hard. <laughs> we know that. It's dangerous to have very strong opinions about things that are fluid, things that are shifting, things that are changing. And I, I want to know whether or not you buy the idea that Facebook is... I mean, this phrase is pretty strong. Ripping apart the fabric of how society works. That is truly where we are. His argument, his name is Chamath uh, Pali, Pali Hapatia, and his argument is that the short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. This is not an American problem. This is not about Russian ads. This is a global problem. It is eroding the core foundations of how people behave by and between each other. Now, he joined Facebook in 2007, made an absolute mint when it floated in in 2012 and admits today that his colleagues feared that they were creating social problems. We all knew in the back of our minds, even though we feigned this whole line of there probably aren't any really bad unintended consequences, that something bad could happen. He says, I just don't use these tools anymore. Tens of millions of dollars in the bank and he doesn't use it himself. I haven't for years. It has created huge tension with my friends and tensions in my social circles, but I guess I innately didn't want to get programmed. I can control my decision, which is I don't use this. And he uses a swear word. I can control my kids' decisions, which is they're not allowed to use this swear word. You don't realize it. And this is why I hope it's going to be an interesting phone-in because I love Facebook. And then I read this line, and I feel a little shiver. You don't realise it, but you are being programmed. It was unintentional, but now you've got to decide how much you are willing to give up. How much of your intellectual independence are you willing to give up? I don't use Facebook in the way that he's describing. You would say that, James. You've been programmed. I know I really don't use Facebook in the way that he's describing. I, you heard the fella up in Annick a minute ago when I mentioned the hotel in his hometown. From It shut 15 years ago, I've, I've, I've discovered. But I'm in touch with my schoolmate, whose dad used to run it, solely because of Facebook. I've got in touch with old, old friends uh, from almost every chapter of my life, and I've found it utterly, utterly gorgeous. When you uh, obviously start appearing on the telly and stuff like that, you're quite easy to find. People people get their memory jogs, look you up, and, and I've reconnected with the lads from prep school. Not as a result of, of uh, anything I've done work-wise, but as a result of the court case I told you about a couple of years ago involving one of our old teachers who was a paedophile, and the fact that there was this wonderful support network that grew up, and Facebook was the locus for it. Uh, I'm in touch with some of my late father's Nephews who I hardly know in real life because my, my dad was much, much, much younger than his half siblings. But I've got I've got a sort of half cousin in Australia. I'm in touch with a half cousin up in Leeds. One of, I haven't even met one of them, and and yet we're it, it, it just feels all good. So what what's the bad stuff? I wish I could use the word that he used. What's the bad sh stuff on Twitter on on Facebook? 
What, what is the bad stuff? I don't know. I know these sort of far-right groups get a lot of traction and traffic, but he's not just talking about that. He's talking about the dopamine feedback loops, which is a little buzz that you get when somebody likes what you've done or, or, or when you see numbers that are impressive. You get a little, a little, a little thrill. I, I have a theory. It's not a particularly profound theory, and I'm sure you've heard variations of it before that every generation thinks the stuff that they've invented is unprecedented, you know? So, uh, everybody, if you're of a negative disposition or perhaps a small c conservative worldview, you, you often fall into the trap of thinking that everything new must be dangerous. So, cinema was going to kill civilization as we know it. The talkies, when the talkies came along and replaced silent films, that was going to be a disaster. When Marconi invented the radio, that was going to undermine civilization and society in untold ways. It's snuff videos. Do you remember them? You could almost just make a list of the things that the Daily Mail has told you to be terrified about over the years and then sort of 10 years later recognize that they're just a normal <clears throat> part of society now. And today it is on the front of the Daily Mail indeed. Facebook ripping society apart, just like video games were going to, just like cannabis was going to, just like video nasties were going to, just like uh, MTV was going to, just like hip-hop was going to, all the things that were going to rip society apart, and society's still here. So I don't know. They've got rather more support for this argument than is traditional, given that the fellow making the argument is one of the key architects of Facebook's success, but I just don't know what he's talking about. And somebody listening to this will. So, the short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. There is no civil discourse. I can see the argument for saying that social media has made uncivil discourse a lot easier. But for me, that began with the comment sections on, on internet newspaper sites, not with social media. And you see the comment sections. Uh, anywhere from the Guardian to the Mail, they're not that dissimilar. People possessed of views that were, shall we say, stifled by what people like to call political correctness. The sort of public expression of vile, vile othering of, of people used to be, even relatively recently, it used to be the kind of thing that people complained about. You're not allowed to say what you want in this country anymore without being called a racist. No, you can say whatever you want, but if you say something racist, you'll get called a racist. Now we've moved to a place where these comment sections have gone into the mainstream. You used to read them a bit like uh, a bit like you were at the zoo. You'd, you'd read them and think, crikey, how can, how can you end up thinking that about fellow human beings? Now, if you look at the, some of the response to the Grenfell Tower tragedy, now it's in, the, it's in the bloodstream of the nation. This poison, utterly, utterly normal now for people. Commonplace, callousness, fetishization of, of cruelty, celebration almost of discrimination. And that's not because of Facebook. Facebook might feed that, but that, for me, began with the comment sections of the newspapers because people who would once have been barking at the moon suddenly found a way to connect with each other. So that possibly addresses one of his points. The dopamine-driven feedback loop is the small kick you get from a little bit of approbation, a little bit of approval, a little bit of admiration online. But again, I don't see it ripping... Every time I say I don't think it's ripping the society, the fabric of society apart, I've got this little voice in my head going, that's because you've been programmed. Now, there's a difference between liking something and being addicted to it. I like water, and I drink it several times a day, but I'm not a water junkie. However, in some cases, there's a fine line between merely wanting something and yearning for it in order to fill an acquired chemical need. And here's the thing. Our attachment to smartphone technology appears to be more in the latter category. It is actually addictive. Now, you may recognise the problem, but in fact, it's not accidentally addictive. It is designed to be so. Because the online world is funded mainly through advertising, those working in it need to both grab and keep our attention to survive and thrive. So understanding how technology addiction works may make you more resilient in resisting it. Well, our technology editor, David Grossman, has been finding out more and meeting one Google former executive who believes what is known as the attention economy poses a threat to democracy itself. For many of us, reaching for our phones has become automatic, as unthinking as blinking. Sometimes I'll just unlock my phone and I'll, I'll lock it again and I won't even know what I've looked at. 
all of a sudden I might just go on my phone and think, why have I, like, I don't need to go on my phone right now. If I'm crossing the road, I can get distracted by my phone and realise, oh wait, there's a car there. <laughs> it's as if we're driven by a power beyond our conscious actions. It's not sensational to say our brains are being hacked because that's pretty much what's happening. Balliol College Oxford was built to withstand the distractions of the pre-smartphone age. The heavy wooden doors and castellated quad are fortifications against attention hijack. James Williams is a former Google executive who became concerned that Silicon Valley's central mission is to interrupt our every waking thought. He resigned and now studies at Balliol. The way we're monetizing most of the information in the world is by distracting people, keeping them from doing what they want to do rather than helping them do what they want to do. No, I don't know anybody, I've never met anybody at least, who wants to spend all day on Facebook or wants to keep clicking articles all day. Uh, if there are people like that, I'd love to meet them because I'd love to understand their, their mind and their priorities. But, you know, when you think about the goals that people have for themselves, they tend to be things like, um, you know, the things that when we're on our deathbed we'll regret not having done. Like, uh, you know, I want to take that trip with my family or I want to learn how to play piano or, you know, uh, spend more time with friends. Like, these are the real human goals that people have. And, and these are the goals, in my mind, that technology ought to be helping us uh, helping us pursue. If they don't do that, then I don't know what technology is for. Most technology companies have another goal. Welcome to the attention economy. Because the internet is funded largely by advertising, the companies need us glued to their apps or they don't make money. Today we're going to set a new mission. Although Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg maintains that his company's mission is, quote, to bring the world closer together. A couple of weeks ago, Facebook's first president expressed a very different, even sinister, objective. How do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible? And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while. Um, because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever, and that's going to get you to contribute more content, and that's going to get you, you know, more likes and comments. I mean, it's a, it's a, val it's a social validation feedback loop that, that it's like a, I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing that a, that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. You can see these results in places like this. These students at Bournemouth University have grown up with smartphones. They can't imagine being without them. The relationship I have with my phone is quite um, intense because I use it like all the time. I think it is part of my body now. <laughs> it is always with me. Because I feel like if I don't have my phone with me and everybody's like talking about memes, for example, I wouldn't understand the joke or what everybody's laughing at because I wasn't on my phone. So how does technology hack its way into our brains? According to psychologists, it taps into our neural reward system. We are driven by natural rewards and these kinds of natural rewards are very basic rewards. Food, water, sex, these are the sorts of things that are making us happy on an everyday basis. But with technology, some of these needs are almost being replaced um, by, uh, by the kinds of social notifications we may receive by the smartphone technology that we are using. So, you know, um, these are technological rewards that can be given to us, that can trick our brain into having those rewarding moments, into receiving those technological rewards that can make us happy eventually. This is the fundament of our being, though. Those, those, those motivations you describe, those, that's the fundamental operating system of our minds, isn't it? Yes. Tapping into our reward system is just the start of the way technology is engineered to hold our attention. In the 50s, the psychologist B.F. Skinner discovered that pigeons could be made more obsessed with earning rewards if you made those rewards unpredictable. Now that produces in a rat or a pigeon or a monkey or, and in a man a very high rate of activity. And if you build up, you can get enormous amounts of behavior out of these organisms for very little pay. You don't need to give them very much to induce a lot of that. But now that's the heart of all gambling devices. Bingo! 
The way apps get you to pull down to refresh the screen is based on Skinner's work. It's just like a fruit machine. You pull, it whirs, and you get a variable reward. Sometimes nothing, sometimes you hit the jackpot. There's a whole industry of consultants, of, of writers, who are basically helping people who are designers draw on this big catalog of cognitive vulnerabilities and exploit them for the purposes of keeping us hooked, keeping us uh, using these products. Another of these vulnerabilities is our brain's inbuilt aversion to loss. For example, Snapchat shows what it calls streaks, how many days a message chain has gone unbroken. Facebook is now testing a similar feature. It's all designed to compel you to message, and it works. It's like a fire emoji, and then it'll be like, oh, you've been on the streak for three days, and then you want to sort of, like, compete, like, with other people, like, oh, how many streaks do you have? And you just feel like you have to reply, and when it goes low, like you're about to lose the streak, it tells you, so then you feel the need to, even if you weren't going to message them anyways or send any pictures, you feel the need to. Smartphones also exploit our brain's inbuilt drive to finish things. If you remove the cue that we've reached the end, well, we just keep going. A food psychologist discovered that when a soup bowl was fitted with a hidden tube that kept it topped up, people would drink pints and pints of soup in an effort to finish the bowl. That's why the Twitter and Facebook feeds never end. We never get a cue to stop. And it's why video sites like YouTube and Netflix will start the next video even before the one you're watching has finished. Before I know it, I've been on my phone, like on YouTube, watching videos back to back for like two hours. When you do actually sit down and try and calculate the hours, you realise how much time has been wasted on things that you could have been doing that were productive. Really? You feel yeah. like you're... <laughs> so why don't you stop? I don't know. It's, I don't want to say it's an addiction, but I just need my phone. <laughs> like... Another very powerful way that we're manipulated is in what we watch. The scientists of the attention economy know that our brains are drawn to stories that prompt strong emotions, like outrage. Balanced discussions may appeal to our conscious intellect, but not the subconscious urges that will keep us clicking and scrolling. So that is what we're served, a diet of outrage. And it doesn't matter if the stories are fake or real, they all serve to grab our attention. Even reputable news organisations are having to adapt their coverage to compete. In the 30s, a former student at Balliol College, Aldous Huxley, predicted a world where manipulation and distraction combined to create a happy, docile populace incapable of self-government. One way of looking at this is that uh, you know, the attention economy is a kind of denial of service attack against the human will. Um, and that has big implications in our own lives because there are things we want to do today, this week, this year, but it has big political implications because, you know, the, the will of the people is the, the basis of the authority of democracy. And if that's being undermined, our political systems, uh, the possibility of democracy is, is very straightforwardly being undermined. The distraction and manipulation of the attention economy is only going to get more refined and more compelling and less noticeable. For example, Facebook and other big tech firms are investing heavily in virtual reality. So unless we're prepared to change the way we pay for the online world, we could literally lose ourselves in technology. David Grossman there, well, could be the biggest problem of our time, couldn't it, really? I'm joined by Tristan Harris. He's co-founded the movement Time Well Spent to spark an important conversation about the kind of future we want from technology. And he was a design ethicist and product philosopher at Google until 2016, where he studied how technology influences a billion users' attention, well-being and behaviour. He was described by The Atlantic magazine as the closest thing Silicon Valley has to a conscience. Uh, a very good uh, evening to you, uh, Tristan. Um, I'm just interested in how much of a problem we should really think this is, because you've likened it to the slot machines, but this isn't going to bankrupt you or it's not going to you know, kill you in the way that some other drugs do. I just wonder whether addiction is quite the right, is sort of quite the right frame to look at it. Yeah, it's actually, it's much bigger than addiction. I would actually call it an existential threat, threat to the human race. And the reason is because uh, there's two billion people who use a smartphone every day. Uh, two billion people use Facebook. That's more than the number of followers of Christianity. Arguably, these tech companies have more influence over our daily thoughts 
uh, than in some cases some of the world's religions, given that we check our phones 150 times a day from the moment you wake up to the bathroom, to the coffee line, to going to bed. Uh, and so the, the total surface area of how much technology is steering two billion people's thoughts is enormous, such that even when you're not looking at your phone, it's, it's implementing or creating the kind of thoughts that you're thinking about now. Uh, and the challenge is that, as James said, and James and I were allies at Google in trying to raise this conversation, and we were worried about all the things that are coming out now around fake news and clickbait, uh, is that you know, th these companies' goals are fundamentally misaligned with our goals and the goals of democracy. But we are, and that we, is why it's an existential threat. But, but, but uh, I mean, it, it, it's not an existential threat, is it? You need, to, you need to posit or to find the harm that it is doing. So, yes, we're wasting quite a lot of time. Yes, we're sometimes misdirected to rubbish when we would have better things to do with our lives. But you, to talk about existential threats, you need to say what actual harm it is doing to all those people who choose to use their phones in this way. Yeah, well, I would, I would just ask in the, in the 150 times a day when, when we check, um, what is going on in that moment right before we check? Is it because we're sitting there and we make a conscious choice? So there's 150 right. conscious choices. Uh, and that's not what's happening. What's happening is that we're building up anxiety, as, as all the science shows. Uh, and the, as the anxiety builds, it actually causes us to self-interrupt. More and more research is showing we actually interrupt ourselves about every 40 seconds. But we're very um, complicit. So we're complicit in this process, aren't we? Because we can, I mean, you know, smoking addicts will tell you it's very difficult to stop smoking and lock the cigarettes in a cupboard. But if, you, if, you don't, if, if you're fed up with your phone and you want to have some uninterrupted time, you put the phone away or you turn it off. It's not... I mean, it's not that difficult. The reason we don't yeah. is we actually quite like getting stuff on the phone, and it does connect us, and we, get, we do get a reward from it, don't we? We, we get enormous benefits from, from these technology companies, and that's not to be denied. I think the challenge is that their goals are not aligned with our goals. I'm going to give you one concrete example. Well, the Snapchat one that you yeah. mentioned. I mean, you, in this case, you have 100 million teenagers. This is a vulnerable population. And you're basically saying um, for... Uh, for each one of your friends next to them, show the number of days in a row that you've sent a message back and forth. So it's like taking two kids, putting them on two yeah. treadmills, tying their legs together with a string, and then hitting start. They both have to keep running and toss the football back and forth, otherwise they lose their streak. And so we've hijacked what 100 million teenagers uh, you know, view as the currency of friendship. The way kids know that they are or are not friends is if that number shows that they've kept that streak up. So that, that is where we're developmentally harming an entire generation of children, undeniably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that's one of the clearest examples where it's not just addiction, it, it's, it's the whole system. No, it's no, going to no, get no. more and more persuasive, And a lot, a lot of parents would just say, yeah, I should stop my, my child engaging in that, in that sort of race. Just tell me about yourself, Tristan. What do you do? Are you an addict? Do you feel you've mastered and control the distraction of your phone? No, uh, I, and I haven't, and I think one of the things that James and I studied when we talked to the, all these experts in persuasion, persuasive technology, which is a field that both he and I have studied, uh, is that even if you know how these techniques work, it, it still works on you, right? I mean, you're sitting inside of the mind-body meat suit that's a mil you know, millions of years of evolution created, so all of these instincts that are getting pulled, you know, if, I, if, I, if you wake up in the morning and you see... Uh, you know, just photo after photo after photo of your friends missing out. You're missing out on what your friends are doing last night. Um, that's going to pull on any human being. You could be the director of the CIA and that's still going to affect you, right? We're all human. And so this is really a conversation about our humanity and whether or not the goals of technology companies are really aligned with that. Tristan, Tristan Harris, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So, shall we have a go at two things here? First up, is it ripping society apart? Do you buy this? Do you keep your children away from it? Have you felt a massive improvement in your life since you switched off and tuned out? 0345 6060 973. And secondly, I've given you the bones of what he said, but you, you could read around it a bit if you wanted to. Secondly, what, what does programmed mean in this context? Because it's quite possible that me sitting here now saying Facebook's great, is evidence of me being programmed. I wouldn't worry on Julie because the kids don't think it's cool. So I think Facebook is going to wither. The kids don't do it. But a lot of older people do. And I want to suggest that they're not damaging themselves or their society, but I'm being told by this bloke that if I do argue that, the chances are that I've been programmed. I'll give you a couple more of his paragraphs and then we'll take a break and then we'll come back with your calls immediately afterwards. He says, we cu curate our lives 
around this perceived sense of perception because we get rewarded in these short-term signals, hearts, likes, thumbs up, and we conflate that with value and we conflate it with truth. Yeah, all right, I agree with that. Instead, what it really is is fake, brittle popularity that's short-term and leaves you even more, and admit it, vacant and empty before you did it. Okay, I've got an insight. Do you want it now or do you want it after the break? Insight alert. Insight alert. I think there's two types of Facebook. I've just realised I'm one type. If you're the other type, you might be ripping society apart. Insight after this. Insight time. Do you want my insight now? My massive in Facebook insight. Or do you want it after we've taken a couple of calls? If I take a couple of calls, they may somehow contribute things that make me realise my massive Facebook insight is not a massive Facebook insight after all. Uh, would that be good or bad? Would you rather I embarrassed myself by telling you the massive Facebook insight now and then have to sort of withdraw from it as the calls come in? Or, or oh, I'm going to take a call. Frank's in Harrow. Frank, what do you think? Um, hi, James. Hello, Frank. So I... So I actually work um, designing user interactions with uh, websites technology. Okay. Um, and one of the major things we do is we do try and increase people's engagement with it. So we do try and get them as, uh, <laughs> your research said, as addicted as possible. You would, you, would you use the word addicted if you were being completely honest? Um, yes. Okay. I, I would. Because I, I was about to get, compare it to upselling. You're just, it's like any product, you're trying to get the consumer to, to, to just take a bit more of it. So it's like, do you want to go large with that? Mm. Mm. But I think it's similar to what they do with gambling. So if you think that gambling is addictive, then uh, on, I think online media is addictive in the same way. Okay. And, and you, you're charged with, with enhancing the functionality to make people more addicted to it. I, I don't see the bad on Facebook in the way that I would with gambling, at least uh, not for one half of Facebook. Until my sparkling insight, people are going to have to try and work out for themselves what the massive distinction is between two types of Facebook use. But, but it doesn't have, it doesn't, I'm not going to lose money or, or my wife by being on Facebook maybe two hours more next year or, or twice as much next year than I was last year, am I? Or not? Um, no, but I, th I think you are encouraged to self-censor because Facebook's algorithm will show people things that Facebook likes to see or things that your friends like to see or things which have been liked a lot. So it encourages people to change, to moderate the opinions they express to get that feedback. Okay, yeah. And, and also, I suppose we have to acknowledge that while it's a little bit of a, as Sam points out, it's a very helpful, very useful argument to say if you disagree with me, it's because you've been programmed, which is what I've extrapolated from this. But I do have to acknowledge this guy will know a hell of a lot more about your world, the, the world of enhancing functionality, increasing addiction than I do. So it, 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 it's if he's talking about what you're talking about, I can't really argue with him, can I? <laughs> I mean, it, I, I think um, in many ways it, it's, it's a place that's not comparable to sort of the traditional world of media, radio, technology, film, no. uh, and so forth, because it is largely guided by what a computer thinks people want to see. Yeah, no, that is interesting. It's all about the algorithm. I don't know if you saw, the, I don't know where it was from because someone pulled it slightly out of context, but it was... A person who was making, a man made a lot of money out of YouTube videos of his children, some of which were a little bit questionable, and he was talking about why, why they did certain things. This is sounding very, very vague, but the crucial line in it was about we were essentially serving the algorithm, the stuff that we, we saw YouTube translate into hits and clicks. We would just serve that algorithm, and, and that feels a bit matrixy when you put it like that, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to hear my sparkling insight? And you can either shoot it down in flames or applaud my perspicacity. <laughs> okay, sure. Ready? I only use Facebook with people I know. Uh, I've got my mm -hmm. privacy settings arranged in such a way that, that y y y I only interact with people that I know. I might not have seen some of them for years, but I know them. I know them. I'd know them if they walked into the room now. That's quite a rare way of doing Facebook. The, the, the kind of stuff this guy's talking about, that's when you're, when you're sort of throwing something out to 
untold millions and hoping to get approval and admiration in return or not? Mm -hmm. I mean, Facebook, uh, it has groups, it has pages which uh, opens the public. Do you not comment on those? Never. Do you not like sort of public content? No, no, of course not. I'd do this for a living, mate. It'd be a busman's holiday, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, I, I, I use Facebook entirely to communicate and interact with people that I like and know. I even cull mm -hmm. it occasionally, get, get rid of people that, you know, I, I kind of only ever ex became friends with because we were working together. We never really knew each other or got on that well. So I, I cure, is the word curate, Frank? Yeah. I curate my Facebook in a very conscientious way. And I, and I, and I hadn't realised I was doing it until I suddenly realised that what this guy's talking about is the Britain first side of Facebook. The, the putting up stuff, whether it's true or not, if it gets a lot of likes, you're happy. And that's, that is, that's what he's talking about, right? Mm. Got it. But I think even, even if you do do that with your friends, there's very real risk that you only express things that your, uh, that your friends would approve of. So everything in that case... I would say could easily become reduced to the sort of level of, you know, dinner party talk. You say what's acceptable to your group of friends or what your group of friends are going to like. I, I, I think we're disagreeing with each other now because I, I prefer what mm. you've just described to the idea. I mean, it's all good to have your thoughts and, and, and opinions challenged and to hang around with people who have, have different world views. But I don't want to see uh, absolute stone cold white supremacism, neo fascism, anti Semitism on my Facebook page. I, I know it exists, but I think the fact that somebody does it, they appeal to those ancient fears and hatreds, so it gets a lot of likes and clicks, travels halfway around the world, and. No, I don't, I don't know that there's any harm in confining your social media interaction to people that you like and know. And that might dilute the, the, the diversity of opinion, but, you know, as you say, that's, that's life. Jill's in Hertfordshire. Frank, that was a great call. Thank you. She says, hello, James. I heard a mother yesterday saying how lonely and desperate she was, but as soon as she put up a photo of her smiling baby and got a like, she felt a little better, while at the same time feeling a fraud and even more hollow and empty and lonely. Oh, wow. That's it, Jill. You've absolutely aced it. She goes on, I've heard my neighbour shouting at her family and I know she gets stressed, but to see her Facebook history, you would think she is living the ideal life. This must prevent unachievable goals for everyone else. We do curate and present an ideal. We have become journalists of our own lives, but journalism with a slant towards everything is wonderful in my life. And if you're not part of that, you must be failing. God, I, I mean, you've made me think of a friend there, Jill. I, I, I've got a friend who's one of my more troubled friends. He sort of flirted with um, uh, the EDL, that kind of thing. And there have been times when I've struggled to keep him on the straight and narrow. And he started filming himself a lot of the time, doing stuff, and, and sort of insisting that people watch the films. That's almost like next level social media fraudulence. But that line there that she's feeling miserable, puts a picture of her baby online, gets a like, feels marginally better while at the same time feeling hollow and empty. And that other one, God, Jill, you could... When are you going on holiday, Beth? I think we've found your stand-in producer. 11.26 is the time. Dan's in Leicester. Dan, what would you like to say? Good morning. Hello, um, so, so Facebook are used to... Do right, just, just hold your horses one second. Are you under 30? No. Are you under 40? No. Why on earth did you just begin a sentence with the word so? You're not allowed to do that if you're over 40. I apologise. That's all right, carry on. Um, Facebook used to be chronological, so it just used to put stuff up in the order that, that it was posted in, and then they decided to show you stuff in the order they thought you might like to see it. Ah. Right, so, oh, I did it again, sorry. Um, <laughs> No, that one was all right. That was a normal so. That, that was a segue so. It's this, ask someone, a, ask a millennial a question, and the answer will be so, followed by something else. What happens when Facebook shows you stuff that it thinks you might like to see is that your reality becomes slightly tweaked and slightly curated and slightly augmented. Uh, if you if you flirt yes. a little bit with the EDL like your friend, then your Facebook feed is going to become more and more and more concentrated with that. And, 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 and to a point where he's drowning in it. He's absolutely drowning in all these weird American Islamophobes, and, and I've never really thought this through before. That That is feeding an unhealthy appetite that he has, isn't it? Brexit is a great... A great um, barometer of this. It seems like Brexiteers and Remainers are speaking two entirely different languages, yeah? Oh, and man, this is what Frank was referring to. They've been convinced of two completely different realities. It's kind of like reverse gaslighting. Instead of making you doubt your reality, it convinces you of a reality that's not 
true. So in my reality, a Brexiteer is a really rare thing. Yes. When it comes on my Facebook feed, I don't know what to do with them. But and I, I don't understand their frame of reference. And but then if it, I, I have one one relative who's a horrible little racist pygmy, and um, whenever I pop into his feed. It's the complete opposite, and the world becomes a very scary place. And that's and why... The problem is that this data is, this data is for sale. Yeah. And that's, that's where Facebook starts to rip society apart, because you can buy this data, and then you can target these people and send them, fill their feed with stuff that makes them act in a way that you want them to act. Which is to feel a lot of hate and fear. So it's a little ironic that it's the front page of the Daily Mail accusing Facebook of ripping society apart. But it is much worse than what the newspapers do. Because a newspaper, although it might exercise a malign and often dishonest influence over a population, it's not as immersive as social media or Facebook is. Well, yeah, I mean, if I, if I, know, that, if I know that I can target the, the feeds of 20,000 really, really cheesed off East Coast English fishermen... Yeah. And I can tell them that if they vote in a, a certain way in the referendum, that, that their fishing industry will be saved. That's really useful to me. And, it, 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 and it's even more useful if it's not true, but you can prevent it as something presented as something that is true. Exactly, because it just sl it just slides effortlessly into a feed, and then suddenly the mystery of Donald Trump's election becomes much less of a mystery. Yeah, it's it's all that Cambridge Analytica aggregate IQ stuff. Um, there's a guy called Alexander Nix. If you look at his YouTube videos, he's absolutely terrifying. But wears a lovely suit. I will. Um, terrifying in what way? Terrifying because he describes reality <laughs> in a terrifying way, or terrifying because he holds terrifying views? In the way that he says things like, I have 5,000 data points on every single adult in America. Yeah. And I can make them do what I want by, feed it, by filling their Facebook feed with... <laughs> That's Lex Luthor, things. isn't it? That's a Bond villain. Yeah, That's Jonathan Price in The World Is Not Enough. Kind of. He has lovely luscious hair, but yeah, essentially... Oh, I hate him even more now. I wish I had lovely luscious <laughs> hair. So that... that yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So that this is... I mean, my insight, perhaps not as sparkling as I thought it was, but it, it still really works. The reason why I'm completely blind to what you and Frank have so brilliantly described is because I keep my Facebook very private. And although it does pop stuff into my feed, anything that doesn't link directly to someone I know, I, I delete and try and arrange the settings in a way that means I don't get stuff dropping into my feed uninvited. But if I, yeah, if, if, if I went on now and found 10, like the stuff that Donald Trump was tweeting, retweeting the other day, if I found 10 of those kind of things that were uh, demonstrably untrue or incredibly exaggerated, designed entirely to whip up racial hatred, and I liked 10 of them and maybe replied to some of them, uh, and you know, by, by misspelling the word patriotic, that seems to be the, the way you do these things, then... And, and I had a completely open Facebook, by tea time, I'd have a hundred more in front of me, and I'd have even more proof that all, all, all immigrants are, are scumbags and all brown people are rapists. Exactly. Your feed would become a very dark place very quickly. Someone actually did a test of it. You can, you can Google it. Some guy did a test of it and, and found himself in a very, very dark place very, very quickly. That's absolutely fast. That rings a bell, actually. I think it may have been Vice. Was it Vice News that did that article? Uh, yes, I think it was. But here's, here's a thing for you. Pop to the Aggregate IQ homepage. They specialise in this stuff. Um, there's a lovely testimonial that says, thanks so much, we couldn't have done it without you, from the Leave campaign. Yeah, interesting. And the Observer journalist, Carol Codwallader, who's been doing some astonishing work in this field, was among the um, journalists honoured last night at the awards where, where Nick Ferrari picked up a couple of gongs. So, um, interesting to reflect that some people were trying to write her off as um, being an eccentric or barking up the wrong tree, but recognised by the industry. 11.32 is the time. Dan, thank you. Uh, anyone else reeling a bit? Because it suddenly makes sense. It's like a light's got God. That's how it... And, and do you remember, Jones, this was back when you still worked here. Do you remember that bloke who rang in when we were talking about the EDL and, and his wife had made him put his laptop away for a month and it saved his marriage? He said, I, I just, I was so angry all the time. And, I, and none of these people had any impact at all on my life. I'm looking at videos, uh, doctored videos that someone is claiming were in Sweden but weren't and just getting angry all the time about everything. Yeah, my mission in life is to, is to diffuse that anger, to, to give, be, be angry about things that are happening, things that are real. Because if you're getting angry about things that aren't happening and things that aren't real, 
you are doing exactly what Dan just described. You're living in a very dark place. I, I'm getting it, and it's not pretty, is it? This suggestion that looks at first glance rather apocalyptic, um, Facebook is ripping society apart, is beginning to make horrible sense thanks to the quality of my callers um, and, and other contributors. For example, this one is, is coming by text. Uh, Alexei Yurchak, when writing about the falling of the Soviet Union, the failing of the Soviet Union, um, uh, Yurchak argues that everyone knew the system was failing, but as no one could imagine any alternative to the status quo, politicians and citizens were resigned to maintaining a pretense of a functioning society. Over time, this delusion became a self-fulfilling prophecy, and the fakeness was accepted by everyone as real. It's a bit Orwellian, isn't it? An effect that Yurchak termed hyper-normalization. There is, you're right, an excellent Adam Curtis documentary called Hyper-Normalization that describes this exactly. And it's given me, for the first time in a while, a much better understanding of, of the poor souls that we, um, we dubbed some time ago the box of trolls, the people who listen to me on the radio, to be a bit self-referential for a moment, with an almost, I mean, a genuinely unbelievable level of obsession. You can see it on the LBC Facebook page. But I must be the only person they ever hear who breaks through their echo chamber. I was the only person. So if you are living almost exclusively upon a diet of race hate and Islamophobia, then to hear me talk to someone like you, these clips I do that go nuts, that's why it happened. I've, off, off, I don't want to overanalyze it in case, in case it slips out of reach. But that's why it happens, isn't it? Because they, t you come on utterly convinced that you're right about these things. And then just two or three very simple questions later, the whole thing falls apart. Whether it's the poor fellow who ends up claiming that he voted to leave the European Union because of bananas, or the other one who claimed last week that he voted to leave the European Union because of brown people. And they don't, in their own minds, think that that's what's gone on. But when they are prevented, presented with incontrovertible evidence that that's what's happened, they have two choices. They either shoot the messenger or they change. And people hate change. So that's why messengers get shot. Crikey. That's it. That's why it happens. Oh, do you want the good news or the bad news? Well, this is the good news and the bad news. I'm not changing. 11.40 is the time. Stephen is in Leeds. Stephen, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. How, How are you? I'm great, but I, I know I'm going to be... It's one of those days where some people listening are going, to go, are going to be going, duh, yeah, finally, and other people listening are going to be doing what I'm doing, which is going, oh, my goodness. Let me play devil's advocate for a while. Come on, then. Is Facebook ripping society apart? I think that Facebook is maybe a, a certain myopic view, uh, a mirror image of the life that we lead. It's it's not necessarily uh, the be all and end all. There is fake news. There, there there is sponsored links. If you buy something from Facebook, the algorithms will will point you towards similar items. All that kind of good stuff. Yes. Essentially, though, what what happens in society is is almost what happens online. But what happens online is you have your trolls, your keyboard warriors, the the hide behind the the wet wipes and and, and 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 the computer screens, and the sixteen years old or eighteen years old or twenty years old or the millennials, basically. Um, well, you, you're ta you're talking about a different constituency from the one I was talking about. The ones I'm talking about are old, old sort of they're old angry men. It's yeah. Barney Farmer's strip in Viz. Have you seen it? Yeah. The, the the Daily Mail strip in 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 Viz. Those are the keyboard warriors I'm thinking of. Yeah, I mean, there is, there is an element of that, and, 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 and going back to your point that you made earlier about that Facebook is falling out of favour with the younger, yes. it's Twitter and Instagram. Um, our generation, 40s, 50s, and, and above, are, are more prevalent on Facebook these days than perhaps. Which uh, is why I, Facebook did influence Brexit and, and, and Trump, whereas it didn't influence young people's votes. Absolutely, but again, I hark back to the, the point that it's, it's a myopic um, mirror image of, of society in itself. You're going to have bigots. You're going to have people talking about, about brown people. You're going to have people talking about bananas and fishing rights. You're going to have that in the pub. You're going to have that in the papers. Yeah, but in the pub, the someone will pull you up on it. You might, you might have managed to curate your social circle in such a way that... But no, because what it's done is, you know the bloke in the pub that everybody moves away from? He's found mm. thousands and thousands of other blokes in the pub that everybody moves away from, and they keep egging each other on to ever new heights of 
obnoxiousness. I mean, you can almost name them on social media, some of these people that have achieved a degree of prominence by being professionally vile. That's their group. That's, that, 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 that's their demographic, you know. But they don't have to acknowledge their vileness because they surround themselves only with people who, who, who think it's all either justified or hilarious. But on, 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 the, on, on the flip side of that, James, you've got all these positive posts, you've got yes. all these positive groups, you've got all this, all this uh, just giving. You've, I've, I've, I've got a personal page, and like you, I've got my privacy settings set, so the only people that can post are, are people that are friends, the only people that can see my profile yes. are the people that are my friends. But in addition to that, I've got a work page because I'm a funeral director and, I, and, and I've got a, a, a Facebook funeral director page. And what that does is, is, is that allows people to leave messages of condolence, uh, okay. that kind of thing. Yes. But what I've got there is I've got, I've, I've got a thousand and odd followers. So some of those then diagram over to my personal page. Yes. So my personal page has got to be monitored by me. I can't put anything controversial on because it links in to... To your business. Yes. But the work that I get from that Facebook page where I can promote, I can pay £10 a day and I can promote to a certain demographic within a, within a geographic area. And, 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 and the, the, the interaction within the social community that comes back. And, and we've put a post on, on, on my personal page and on the work page where we're going out on Christmas Eve and we've asked to donate uh, for donations for clothing and food for the homeless. I've I've got a garage full of stuff, and it's only been up two weeks. Uh, yeah, That's the positive side of Facebook. Yeah, no, you're right to remind us. I don't think you're being the devil's advocate. You're, you, you're being a voice of reason. But does does that positive side? outweigh the negative side from where I'm sitting it doesn't because how many people who get these these vile videos popping up in their feed and, and think that they're real or true or click on them and pass it on and share it how many of them would be surprised to learn that someone has paid to do that yeah, I mean, no, no, not many people would. Um, it comes up as a sponsored link, and once it says sponsored link above the, above, the, above the post, you know it's been paid for. So whether it's selling a watch, whether it's selling a terrorist video, or whatever. And the, the problem is with social media is it's not like the mainstream media where, where like you say, it's edited and checked. And checked Even again. for all its myriad failings and horrors, you will at least get some form of redress if, for example, a blatant lie or a massive mistake is made. You don't get any of that on a Facebook feed the, the, that's a problem that's a problem but you could say that with with twitter you could say that with instagram that the the, the, the moment is now with with media and the 24-hour news society and the, the, the constant feed it's more the for more the fake news I, I think the one feeds off the other but but the, the the american election even more than brexit was an absolute triumph of of deliberately disseminated dishonesty and and that's i suppose um, what Chamaf Pali Hapatio is talking about. I, 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 that, that's what he means by ripping society apart. Wow. 11.45 is the time. Um, Cambridge Analytica getting a lot of mentions in our feeds. It is very, very well worth reading up on them. If you don't follow me on Twitter, uh, then check out Carol Cadwallader at The Observer. She's done some of the best journalism on it. Not by any stretch of the imagination. The only journalist are, are, are toiling away. But if you do follow me on Twitter, at Mr. James O'B, I've, I've put up links and will do again to, to some of the work in this field. It's all... And, and a little bit of me has failed to grasp it properly until today. I haven't really understood the, the power that the head of Facebook is now describing. Of course, if, if that's on the front of the mail, we're unlikely to link it to Brexit, given that the mail was the biggest cheerleader for Brexit in the country. But if, if I don't know, maybe if, if, if they were presented with evidence of dissemination, deliberate dissemination of dishonesty and deception, but no, of course not, because people were talking about Turkey, weren't they, in the run-up, and they were the official campaigners. No one called them out at the time. God, we really are in a hole. It's 11.46. You remember when David Davis said to Nick yesterday that he didn't have to be very clever to do his job? Um, <sighs> some possible evidence to the contrary here. I'm just having a look at Giva Hofstadt's Twitter feed. Um, they've, they've added some amendments to that agreement that was reached last week. Where, and this is literally added now to the official documentation. Whereas comments made like those by David Davis calling the outcome of phase one of the negotiations a mere statement of intent risk to undermine the good faith that has been built during the negotiations. <laughs> They've now insisted that, well, I'll read it to you, um, the negotiations can only progress during the second phase if the UK government also fully respects the commitments it made in the joint report and they are fully translated into the draft withdrawal agreement. 
So, I mean, he was, he was wrong both times. He was wrong when it said it was not legally enforceable. Then he was wrong again when he said it was legally enforceable. It's quite an astonishing achievement because obviously he didn't understand, because you don't have to be very clever to do his job, that the presumption is that it would be legally enforceable. But if you're going to cast aspersions and doubts on that, then we'll insist that you write it into law. So that's what will happen. It will be fully translated into the draft withdrawal agreement. I have a horrible feeling that to successfully, and, and contrary to what some of you might think, I, I do still believe that we could have undertaken Brexit in a way that wasn't catastrophic. Um, but history will probably look back on that, that comment on this radio station yesterday as, as evidence. How the hell didn't they sit when the bloke in charge said you don't have to be very clever to do this, to get, to coin one of my phrases, eggs out of a baked cake, you don't have to be very clever. Yeah. 11.53 is the time. I've also, uh, while we're talking about social media and indeed are on social media, I've just retweeted a couple of, um, that's really interesting, a couple of uh, references to, to the account of that journalist I was telling you about, Carol Codwallader. And do you know, oddly, I mentioned that she won an award last night um, for this investigation. And oddly, um, there's a deleted tweet from, from uh, Dominic Cummings, who, who, who ran Vote Leave, accusing her of bad journalism. Funny. I don't think he was in the room uh, when she picked up her award. 11.53 is the time. Chris is in Shaftesbury. Chris, what would you like to say? Hello, James. How are you? I'm all good, mate. What's on your mind? Good, good. What's on my mind? Right, well, um, I'm, um, I'm a millennial, by definition. So? I've grown, I've grown so, up. So, 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 so. so, yeah, so. so a bit of banner with you, James. <laughs> so. Um, so, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've grown up with Facebook. Um, and it's... Um, I've, I've grown up with it from from the day it started and how it's all gone on. And I appreciate what what you say and what a lot of, a lot of other people will repeat that you know we um, we didn't like it when the book first arrived. We didn't like it when we uh, when the TV arrived or yeah. the radio. But um, as a wise man once said, a stopped clock will be right twice a day. You're absolutely on it. Uh, but yeah, uh, but because this I feels different, this is, like, and, and I mean, for people, what what you're referring to is an observation I made earlier. For people who weren't listening, that, that every generation thinks that its innovations are unprecedented, that, that nothing like this has ever happened before, yeah, and that's when I you say, say a, a, a stopped clock is right twice a day. Maybe this is the unprecedented innovation. Yeah, and the evidence I'd bring forward for that is this. Go on. When the book came, when the radio came, when the TV came, it was all a part of household, um, uh, the, the family community, if you like. You know, it was all a part of the family. It was all overseen by the parents. Moderated. Everyone, moderated yeah, by moderated. company. Thank yes. you, James. Yeah, yes. moderated. But now, Facebook and technology is out of everyone else's hands. It is specifically individual and personal. So you can't get away from it. You can't um, you can't oversee it, and you you can't control it. Um, so parents have no real control over what their kids are doing on Facebook and what they're liking, what they're not. So yes, I believe that this Facebook issue is going to be unprecedented because people um, people can construct an entirely false reality and refuse to to move away, and then you get this this other element that. I think is very crucial to modern politics, to, to, to fake news. The I know you are, but what am I school of thought, which actually sums up Donald Trump in a way. I know you are, but what am I? He takes criticism. He actually is a self-confessed sex offender. I know you are, but what am I? And you get people who've constructed a false reality, one that's pretty much driven exclusively by race hate. And mm -hmm. and and then you say, oh, well, I don't want any racists on my feed. And, and they say, oh, you're exactly the same then. And you're going, no, I, I'm, I'm yeah. removing lies from my feed and you're removing truth from yours and you're trying to claim an equivalence between those two things. And that, that's... And, that. it's getting, and worse than that, James, worse than that, when, when you were a young boy and you wanted to speak to your mum and your dad about the birds and the bees, yeah. you spoke to your mum about the birds and the bees. Where are, where are the kids going now where they want that kind of information when they want... Uh, they just Google it. They Google search something that they don't want to talk to their parents about. Back in your generation, forgive me, 
but back in your generation, you you had a not lot necessarily, of mate. That's no. And can you paint a slightly uh, Dickensian picture of my youth? You'd normally talk to your yeah. mates. You get some appallingly yeah. false information about stuff from from. I mean, I was lucky that I could go to my mum, but most people couldn't, and they sort of muddled through. I don't know. I, I think up until. I mean, sure, bad example, James. But you see where I'm coming from. Less that, less less communication with real things. people in real life, but with people who love you and care for you. You'd rather go online and be sucked into a false reality by people who don't, who neither love nor care for you, but are going to use your anger to achieve their malevolent goals. Well, exactly, which is why I guess this, why it gets, issue, why it becomes an issue when it gets political. Okay, and, and that is in many ways why we are where we are. But of course, people who've fallen into this will now be doubling down on their fury, thinking, I didn't vote that way because I was manipulated, I voted that way because Sweden is full of rapist immigrants and here, look, here's a clip to prove it that is actually 24 years old and was filmed in I mean, Leamington Spa that's it, isn't it? 11.57 is the time, squeeze in one more, Shams is in the city we were talking about you yesterday Sweet, in a positive way I hope it was a positive way, you know why Go on the cat, not the cat. Yeah, I, I, do you know what I said to Beth? I said he doesn't like it because I I think you got into trouble for telling that story on the radio. Of course, of course I did. Whenever I bring it up, I can sense in the back of your voice there's a little bit going. Just shut up, mate. That's not why I've rung in. Also, you rung you ring in a lot less than you used to do because you know what I'm going to remind you. It's because I'm working, and today, because of the snow, I can play it. Rather, so, fortunately, <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. All um, right, carry on. I won't mention the cat. Don't mention the cat. Don't mention the cat. Yeah, okay. Carry on. All right, before, before we progress, can I just say the quality of the podcast recently have gone through the roof. Don't, you're going to get me do. into so much trouble. Were you, were you told to say that? No, no, no. Because you know I changed producer well, about two months ago. and, and th Exactly, Caroline. I complained about Caroline once about the quality oh, of the podcast. No. Right, let's play the cat yes. clip. Let get me the cat clip. We're going to play Shams's. No, 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 yeah, we are. We're going to play that clip after twelve o'clock. That's your punishment for dissing my former producer. Now, what did you ring in to talk no. about? Okay, a lot of the points have been covered, uh, namely about the echo chamber and yes. the example about the guy that phoned phoned in and said that um, he switched off listening to the far right and he became a calmer, uh, far better person. Yes. Uh, for me, it's on the same, but on the, from a snowflake point of view. Um, I switched off from Facebook for the past year, and I have to say, I am so much calmer. I do not get angry in the mornings. I'm not shouting at people for the... Uh, for, purely because <laughs> it wasn't about my friends, but it was the comments from the friends of friends about subjects that they didn't understand or liking something and thinking that they've done some good, like, yes. like give a prayer for someone. It's just, it was just the fakeness and also the insincerity within Facebook. And that's that, now, it's doing them damage as well. That, that, that message from Jill yeah. describing the woman she, she heard complaining about her baby and then feeling a sort of brief, hollow happiness when she got a like for a picture of her baby. The false realities people put up. You know, a kid's on his way to Borstal, but you've got a picture of him looking like a choir boy. Yeah, um, but but there was the other thing but, well, I will disagree with you on is the uh, damage to Facebook as opposed to the written media. I think um, the papers such as the Daily Mail have caused far more damage to society than Facebook has, okay? Because Do you really think so? Yeah, because the difference with the written media, as demonstrated by some of your callers over the past few weeks, yes. is that the people read it and say, because it's in the newspaper, it must be true. I think it's the well, same. I mean, we'll agree to disagree for now, but I think people are seeing stuff on Facebook. It might be our age, this, or possibly our education level, but we, we, we can see stuff and know that it's not true on social media, and we think something's more likely to be true if it's in a newspaper for younger or, or less educated people that might not be the case i found that absolutely fascinating and not a little frightening and and some stuff i've been struggling with um just actually started to make sense i'm going to tell you this probably a few times before christmas because it's the surest way of making sure that i actually knuckle down um either that or i spend the advance and then i'll be left with a similar necessity that i'm going to write a book that addresses quite a lot of the stuff that we were sort of talking about in the last hour um, and about the the, the, the kind of di dis di well the, almost the destruction of objective truth in in media coverage with reference to to big recent political events the rise in the kind of race hate and the and the um, uh, the bigotries and the phobias that we're seeing uh, back on a on an almost industrial scale and it's written as as regular listeners to this program will know it's written from a from a position of love uh, for the people who've fallen into these traps so that hour has really helped me. 
really help me understand where those traps are. And, and once you sort of see it through that prism, everything else starts slotting into place. As you just heard there in the news, J.K. Rowling got uh, a gong today. Lily Allen has a record out, and Francis tweets, it's because decent people no longer have their voices represented. Those of us who want to be kind and inclusive and make the best choices are not considered. Those trying to stand up for us are shouted down. We need someone charismatic who will stand up for ordinary, nice people. But yeah, I think you might be onto something.